hello everybody and uh, welcome welcome to this uh, episode of the four thinkers talk series uh, my name is uh, dr ivo pizzuto i'm a professor of economics and management and the founder of ivo pizzuto forward thinking lab uh, in this episode um this space in particular we have uh, um, we invite uh, prominent and emerging uh, entrepreneurs company leaders forward thinkers uh, in order to share uh, to let them share their provoking ideas, expertise in business, economics, management, and on the latest innovations, emerging trends, technology, and uh, uh, ideas. I'm very pleased to have today uh, here with us Francesco Scalambrino, a great innovator, forward thinker, and entrepreneur. So, Francesco, welcome to this uh, Hi, episode. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thank you for having me. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks for taking the time. We know that to be uh, an entrepreneur of a you know startup and uh, uh, it's a very busy schedule. So we we appreciate with big gratitude for the time you take for doing this because we know it's not easy in the, this stage of your um, activity. So Francesco, to, to get started with the, the questions, uh, uh, um, you are the co-founder and the chief product officer of Jet HR um, and uh, the former top manager of international unicorns uh, like country manager of Italy for paid feet and product director for Oyster and had a great uh, international experience. So you have a, a lot of experience as an entrepreneur, as a startup. Uh, your current new venture, Jet, Jet HR, is a promising uh, tech startup which aims to deliver seamless and user-friendly digital HR services, in particular to SMEs, uh, small and medium-sized firms, through you know, your proprietary application or software service uh, uh, platform. Uh, I've read that uh, uh, your company's mission is to help firms streamline processes, improve automation, productivity, scalability, most of all, eliminate bureaucracy. Um, we were like, we're really curious, we'd like to know more about what is Jet HR? What is all about? And why do you think this uh, uh, initiative, this venture, can be a game changer for Italy? And also, what is the innovation gap your company is aiming to fill with this new and uh, unique business model? Sorry for the long question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so thanks again for for having me and for the opportunity. Um, so uh, I will I will answer uh, step by step. So the first uh, question is, what is Jet HR? Uh, so JetHR is a new platform because uh, we started uh, less than one year ago. Um, and the goal of this digital platform is to provide a uh, easy solution for companies from one employee to six, 700 employees to manage uh, employees, hire them, onboard them, manage their holidays, manage their bonuses, uh, pay them, uh, run the payroll, give them a laptop, uh, stay compliant with uh, with trainings and security and a lot of other stuff. So it's the only one uh, place for companies to manage in an easy and digital way their their employees. Uh, this, the, the center of it uh, probably is the employee directory and the payroll, but uh, it's a it, it's, it's very horizontal product. Uh, so we basically we aggregate a lot of services, we streamline the user experience and we let company uh, companies uh, use the product and manage their employees easily compared to having a lot of providers and maybe some of them are not digital so this is what we do which was uh, your your first question the second question was uh i think like why this is a, an opportunity or a game changer in italy uh yeah. if i remember correct so <clears throat> so why why we think that uh, why in italy um so there are similar companies uh, around the globe, especially in, in US, uh, where rules and bureaucracy is a bit uh, lower, uh, a lot lower, <laughs> probably. So uh, there it happened uh, years and years ago, and now the, those, co those uh, platforms are evolving. While the opportunity now is in Italy because uh, the level of bureaucracy uh, and the regulations uh, that we have in Italy connected to employees managing people and so it's extremely high and so it's very difficult to streamline and digitalize uh the processes but now we are in a point in which 
creating technology, creating companies is much better than 10 years ago. And so the opportunity is that we think we can create a much better user experience. I think that now also Italy is uh, is ready to, to digitalize that, uh, that this part. And so the opportunity is that we are the first one moving uh, into this direction with a solution for the end user, which in this case is the company itself and not with a solution for the intermediaries. So we, our software is designed to be used and by the, 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 the company itself, it's not a pro software that has to be used by a, a specialist that then sell his service to the to the company. So we go directly to the company. Okay, uh, so this, this is this is the opportunity and uh, what differentiates us from from other companies. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. This is a you know, uh, an important uh, uh, value proposition. Uh, you know, the single platform, as you said, for uh, all HR management activities from administrative tasks to any other uh, uh, task related to, to that. So that's very, <clears throat> very, very interesting. And um, uh, um, also, you, you basically uh, explained why you and your co-founder have decided to launch, in particular in Italy, uh, uh, in this country, because of the bureaucracy and because of the need of the mission to 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 try to reduce the bureaucracy, especially for the uh, SMEs uh, uh, and to create this opportunity. Uh, regarding the second point, um, w- regarding this point, what would you see as, uh, you know, uh, uh, in the future, what do you see as uh, opportunities and challenges in uh, eventually, uh, uh, you know, scaling up, uh, internationalizing uh, uh, a digital platform model uh, starting for one country and going uh, international. And we generally think of, you know, internationalization, export, whatever, more to products uh, and services and less in terms of uh, uh, digital platforms and uh, digital business models like uh, <clears throat> your uh, company is, you know, the uh, software as a service platform. Uh, for uh, internationalization, uh, uh, now, regardless of whether you want to do it immediately or later on, uh, how do you see the pros and cons opportunities and challenges in, when you try to take uh, a platform international, thinking about Europe, but that could be other countries uh, uh, related to differences in the different countries? And what are the you know the the the, 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 the challenges and opportunities? What are the pros and cons and the uh, implications that uh, that require, considering that you have experience uh, with uh, uh, digital platforms and uh, uh, tech uh, business uh, operating uh, in international locations. You work in Paris and France and, and, and in other places, so you do have an understanding of what it's like working uh, in a different country with the uh, digital business model. Yeah, so that's a, a very broad and interesting question. So basically, how is to try to internationalize those type of platform? So yes. The if I try to be uh, structured in my in my in my answer, I would say that internationalizing products that are regulated and they are uh, like 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 ours, it's very very difficult because um, when you are in US, the market is enough to to build something. And yes, you have a bit of different uh, different regulations between one state or another state in US. But in the end, there are a lot of things in common, like uh, some laws are in common, the language uh, is in common, uh, the digitalization of the country is somehow in common. Uh, while while in, in Europe, uh, we really, uh, every country is different, every market is different, the level of digitalization of each market is different. Uh, some aspects of the regulations are different. So in our case, the labor laws, the payroll, the tax implications, <laughs> everything is completely different. If you build something in, in Italy, and then you want to do it in Spain because you think that, okay, Spain is somehow similar culture than, than Italy. Then you face a completely different reality in terms of laws and, and whatever. So it's not that you just um, try to localize the product or uh, and it works. You have to rebuild half of the product from scratch. Mm-hmm. And also in terms of go-to-market, it's very difficult when you go into this type of uh, products because maybe in one country you just have uh, an accountant that also serves the payroll and some HR services. Uh, in other countries, you have a split of roles between who's doing the payroll and who's doing the accountant. So there are a lot of things that are specific country by country. And so to answer to your question, 
it's very, very hard. Um, and the more you go into a regula the regulated aspect of it, because you you want to wipe out the bureaucracy, right? So what we want to do is to really go into the regulations and try to simplify so that we get the difficult part and we expose a simple user experience to the customer. So the more you go deep into the bureaucracy, the more it's difficult to do it in another country, okay? So this is our general thought. And so um, what is our belief is that you should dominate a geography. So in in a one case, in our case, it's Italy, before you dilute your effort and open too many markets. That doesn't mean that we'll, we will never be international, but it means that we are just focused on Italy until we crack the market, until we we know that that is scaling well here, and then we have enough uh, CPU like our head mm -hmm. to 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 focus on another geography, and then maybe we will go to one single geography and so on. Mm -hmm. While some other startups uh, in our space, um, they try to, in my opinion, uh, they try to scale too fast in uh, other countries, and they were not big enough. And uh, they started diluting efforts mm -hmm. on four or five geographies in a regulated uh, environment. Right. And, and and it's very, very inefficient. Mm -hmm. So our approach is one geography, dominated the geography, then in case thing to a second and a third geography. Absolutely. Oh, thank you, Matt. That's very insightful. And just out of curiosity for myself, would you say, not necessarily for your company now, but in general, uh, that, uh, um, you know, uh, expanding the business internationally, given this type of business model and regulatory uh, uh, constraints and, uh, you know, would it be easier uh, to go with uh, uh, an m and type of strategy? You buy something international because they know already regulation stuff locally, or it's easier to go greenfield, you, you just develop uh, um, subsidiaries or part of your activities there rather than just uh, doing acquisitions in, in, a, in a software, in a platform business model? So I, I in, my, in my career, uh, like before Jet, I, I worked for two companies that were both in, in Europe, so international, and uh, they follow different approaches. The first one was doing small acquisitions uh, to start a market. And uh, the second one was building from scratch. Mm -hmm. um, it's very difficult to 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 answer. I would say that according to our um, philosophy, probably it's easier to build from scratch because you want to focus on one single country at a time. So in theory, you reach a level in which you have enough resources and enough focus to say, I want to start one single geography. So I'm able to focus and to to start to, to, to do the research uh, and stuff. Well, if you want to open, I don't know, three three countries uh, in two years or on one year, it, it could be easier to, if you have the money to, to do the M&A, to say, okay, let's start acquiring fast three companies, one per geographies, so that I can kick off and speed up the, the first part to the yeah. discovery and having already customers. So I tend to think that it's better to, 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 to do less geographies and build from mm -hmm. scratch. Yeah. Um. Then, then, then to just just buy and then, uh, and then go faster in that in that sense. But I don't know. I it's maybe it's my gut feeling. I, and I, so I I see a point. You say you have to be uh, strong in one co country to start with, and then you can grow elsewhere. Yeah. 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 Uh, totally. Uh, just just one final point on this question. Uh, what about the talent pool? Uh, differences in different countries. How difficult it is to find a good talent pool in Italy, for example, rather than abroad in terms of digital uh, skills. Yeah, that's a very good one. Like, so what we're seeing is that for sure in Italy, we don't miss the talent. Mm -hmm. there, there are talented people. We, we still have good schools. Um, we are good developers. We are good, especially good designers, I think. Um, like, we have good, good, uh, good and talented people. The problem in Italy is that if you for example, in our case, we, we, we launch a SaaS B2B product. You need a talent, of course, to, but, but also it would be easier if you have a talent that work in a place in another SaaS B2B. Okay. The problem is that there are not a lot of ecosystem. Like if you, so you don't have other SaaS B2B, for example, in our case, to steal talents. 
So you need to grow your own talents because we are not in an ecosystem in which, I don't know, we have five unicorns that scale up uh, SaaS B2B. So you, you, you don't have names to go there and, and, and get the talents. Uh, while, uh, for example, when I was working in, in Paris, France has a very good ecosystem in terms of startup. So there were like a unicorns category, almost your unicorns category, like a series A category, series B categories, like a lot, a lot of pools of, of famous startup. And if you wanted to, 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 to steal a talent or to get a talent, you have a great pool of good companies in which you know that those people are talented and they are skilled on SaaS, on uh, B2C and whatever. In, in Italy, we miss that part. And if you're doing a, a regulated product, uh, it's very difficult in, a, in, in this stage to say, okay, I will go outside to steal a talent because... If you don't want, if you need a Italian regulations, you need people that understand the regulations so that speaks Italian. So I would say that this part probably is one of, if we could, if we could reach the talents in all Europe would be much easier. But right now for this phase, we want people to understand the law. We want people to understand the regulations and at least you need to speak Italian. So this part, it's pretty, pretty difficult. Okay, that's that's a very good point. Very good explanation and very insightful, uh, important aspect on the competitiveness in each country. Now, if I remember correctly, your background, you are uh, an engineer from uh, Polytechnic uh, of Milan, um, a great school. And uh, uh, of course, uh, and, and in particular, I think you were a mechanic, you are a mechanical engineer. Now, how did you get into the HR tech, you know, in particular in the HR uh, space, uh, uh, you know, and how how did you get to this thing? You know what are the uh, um, what what gets you there first of all, and uh, and uh, in particular about your current uh, new venture, you know uh, Jet HR, which the world you know Jet already gives an idea of speed. Uh, what are the cultural, uh, organizational, and uh, you know operational uh, uh, models, uh, uh, you know practice that. Uh, you think define a little bit the culture of your startup, and uh, what did you learn abroad that you know you think uh, it's, it makes this uh, an enabler for uh, innovation in the country? What, what 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 you know what is so strong about uh, uh, your um, organization in terms of an entrepreneurial uh, culture yeah. that's leading to high you know motivated, uh, highly motivated, and high performance teams? How do you get uh, teams to be highly motivated? And how do you recruit? How do you get the talents? and motivate them to be high performance and speedy innovators in this country? Yeah, so I will answer to, to both questions. So the first one, how I ended up in into HR tech, yeah, yeah. Um, like uh, almost randomly. Like uh, I was uh, I was a designer in the first part of my career, and then a product, I, I switched to product management, and I was working uh, in uh, other companies, also B2C uh, companies. And then at some point, I joined uh, Payfit uh, in France. Payfit was one of the most promising uh, companies in in France at the time was still the time of series B. Uh, I met, I met the founders and uh, they, they, they convinced me to, to join. Uh, I think at that point it was like 200, maybe 250 people. So it was already scaling, but it was not uh, like a huge. Uh, and then I, and was, I mean, was run. I, I like the founders. I like the company, but I never, I, I, I never worked in HR before. And then after I saw uh, the opportunity there, what they were doing there, the company uh, grew so much into a unicorn uh, company, more than 1,000 employees and so on. I kind of went so deep into the pro the, the problems of uh, to solve that I almost fell in love with uh, this HR tech. And I think that the reason is that there are so many problems to solve. It's not just one single problem. It's, like you have to hire, you have to onboard, you have to pay, you have to be compliant with taxes, you have to, you know, everything. It's like uh, doing a lot of startups altogether. Yeah. So it's not easy to, to get bored from uh, from my point of view. Um, the second uh, the second question of yours was uh, how what are the values? How we operate at Jet? What what is uh, different from other companies? Yeah. So if I have to. To be to, to to sum it up in few words, uh, the only things that matters for us, um, and we really go extreme on this, is the speed of iteration. So we really believe that the only 
chance that we have to become huge is to iterate really fast because in uh, in uh, in this space there are a lot of undigitalized player or digitalized player but they do software that is not easy to use and those guys have so much money so mm-hmm. if, if they want they, they they have money to invest uh but they are usually they are slow so we have resources that are super limited compared to those uh, big names but we are super fast and we and we and we go extreme on this so our, our value is speed of iteration so we just believe in speed of iteration and um this is a value that we we use also to select people so when we do recruiting um we try to understand if we are fit for this candidate and if the candidate is fit for us which means look if you come here you will not do things in a perfect way you will not follow the book of how to do things perfectly we rather go fast and then we iterate if things are not good enough right. so we really iterate and uh, we really iterate fast we always talk to customers um and we really try to deliver as fast as we can and this engine give us a lot of advantage till we we can sustain this speed so this is what is all about and we use it also to select people to uh it's one of our main driver um and the second one i would say is that we believe so much in autonomy and it's really reflected in 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 our company culture like we we tend to hire senior profile uh we have for example in in product position like uh, designers and engineers uh we don't have junior profiles so all mid or senior profiles and uh we um we believe so much in people and in autonomy of people that our company for example is full remote but not full remote hey but you have to be in the office one day a week yeah there are people that we saw just one time in six months okay. uh we really don't care where you are because we we trust you um we just organize company retreats but just for the sake of being together and build a team but basically we we never see people in in real life except the group that is in milan so the group that is in milan usually we, we come to the office together but uh, we really trust people we trust the autonomy of the people um so i would say that speed and autonomy and trust is probably the two values uh, that we are uh, carrying on so you 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 are aiming to reduce bureaucracy outside for the for the market for the clients and you definitely reduce bureaucracy internal <laughs> yeah that, exactly that, correct, <laughs> co- correct correct like we do everything to reduce overheads internally yeah. like a, the, as long as we can we will keep the hierarchy flat yeah uh now we're close to 30 people we are we have other 10 positions open yeah so, so for a company of uh, nine months is is a lot of people yeah uh, but we are trying to uh really to reduce as much as we can the overhead and yeah. you do that by giving few rules then your people you can trust and the, this this re- reduce a bit the overhead. If you set so many rules because you don't trust the people because you are a control maniac, like then 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 you start feeling bureaucracy already. 30, 40 people, you already start feeling the bureaucracy, the internal bureaucracy. Yeah. So you have this entrepreneurial mindset where every employee is an entrepreneur basically and is uh, uh, equally engaged, uh, motivated, and interactive with all the others. Yeah. Yeah. Very- yeah correct. Yeah. Very lean, very agile, very uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, um, uh, you know, network type of organization. Okay, yeah. but so that's very, that's very, that's very exciting, very interesting. Uh, this moment, this uh, this particular moment uh, um, uh, of our you know uh, life or our business, uh, it seems that there is a, a huge, a very exciting uh, uh, hype for, uh, and also not only hype but also commitment to digital transformation to. Uh, acceleration of the uh, digital business models and so on. And in particular, now there is a big uh, uh, focus on uh, digital innovation algorithm, algorithms, uh, AI, generative AI, LLM models, you know, large, large language. And all this acceleration in digital like cloud uh, based cloud computing uh, strategies. Now, um, uh, you know, is this in, in this particular moment? How is your company, uh, your current, your firm currently uh, uh, viewing this uh, trend and planning perhaps to grow 
also in the AI-driven HR tech services. Yeah, that's a very good uh, good one. So in the beginning, we were, I mean, beginning, uh, when I say beginning, it means uh, six months ago or eight months ago. Um, we were not looking at that, but now we are start doing tests uh, because we see opportunity, especially in the customer support, to start using AI based on our own contents and on our own uh, proprietary contents, not to the final customer so that the customer can ask things to, to, to AI, but for our operations team, so customer support and so on, that can leverage AI trained on proprietary contents to uh, to streamline the replies, to start streamlining some processes, uh, onboarding processes and so on. So we see the opportunity, especially, I mean, at least right now, we see the opportunity, especially as an internal tool for the operations to onboard customer faster, to always have a, dra- a right to draft uh, of a, an answer to a ticket. So we, we see, uh, we are trying to do some experiments, but I think the next year we will for sure deliver something as an internal tool. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because I imagine that uh, moving forward, uh, AI will also be an enabler for you know customer experience and simplifying some processes, uh, uh, even on the customer uh, side. You know, in terms of uh, yes, uh, um, I, I I was reading about a number of companies focused, especially in the US, on starting a recruiting like uh, Skill Eight, Eightfold, uh, Fuel Fifty, Higher View, Seek Outs, and many others that are doing things with the AI in the um, human resources area, and I think yeah. probably that 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 the market is growing very fast. Yeah, like we, I, I think we will start internally because also you have more control. Basically, you are testing the quality of what AI is doing before releasing externally. Yeah, maybe we will release at some point externally, but for sure we want to keep control of the quality of what we're doing. So it's I think it's a great thing to start internally. In our space, and then maybe to study that uh, as an external tool. Well, yeah, very, very, very interesting, and I'm sure there's going to be a lot of very exciting uh, new, new initiatives, new projects uh, that uh, on your, uh, you know, on your radar for these things. And just, I know I'm, uh, I'm taking a lot of time from you, so I just want to ask two final, very quick. Uh, 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 questions, if I can. One is uh, um, about, you know, it's a small team, but uh, leadership, you know, you said a lot about your leadership, and I just this came to my mind. How do you, you know, influence uh, um, role model as a role model? How do you inspire uh, 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 not just in this experience in the last job, but even the previous ones? How do you get to, you know, uh, to inspire the others and to be, you know, not only a forward thinker and an innovator, but also uh, an inspiring leader, which is somehow, I mean, from my point of view, probably even harder. <laughs> Try one thing is to be a talented, uh, brilliant person. Another thing is to get the whole team to to be uh, engaged, uh, even more motivated. I, 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 from your experience, how do you get to be a leader that's really transformational and inspiring for you? Yeah, like uh, this is also a good question. I never thought deeply about uh, like these kind of things. So um, sometimes it comes. You think it's it comes natural, but uh, it's a process that maybe uh, took uh, ten years to to become uh, how how you're playing the role uh, now. So, like, I would say that in my last two or three experiences, and in Jet for sure is is a uh, is the case. I think that being a leader is much easier because we set the bar very high in the recruiting. So we select, we attract like the good people. And then after you put the bar so high, so talented people, uh, very empowered by the mission that you have, very fit to the company, to the stage of the company, to the values of speed and all the values that we have, that then when they they, they join, and also a lot of people are senior, so you you don't need to be really a mentor, but more like uh, someone that helps them to, to deliver and so on. So when you, when you set the bar so high in, in 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 recruiting, I would say that being a leader it's much an easier job because you have super senior people that yeah. sometimes are much better than you in what in what they do, That's um, and, and so the the job honestly it become it become pretty pretty easy 
Yeah. The problem is that you need to be very, very consistent and and good in recruiting. The the problem comes when you lower a bit the bar on recruiting because maybe you have 20 positions opened and you have two months or three months or four months to, to, to fill those positions. And at some point you start saying, okay, I, I, I'm in a rush and I need to, to hire. And then when you hire the wrong people, or I mean, there's not like totally right or totally wrong. Let's say that there are people that are, that is also the, the gray area in the middle. But when you start to, to get those people, then you need to spend time managing, managing them, motivating them, extra motivating them because otherwise they're not motivated enough yeah. explaining uh, and then and then it becomes difficult um yeah. for now like uh again like the bar was high in the in the air recruiting we were lucky probably and i have to say that even in my previous company um the culture was really good and the bar was high enough that also the the, the, the leadership role there was kind of easy going yeah. back in the past i I experienced much more like people that were not fit mm-hmm. and then you need to manage them. People that were not uh, aligned to the mission and then you need all the time to motivate them or like that was much, much harder. Mm-hmm. So, okay. So you say it's easier to coordinate a team of highly motivated and talented people because they are all <laughs> very much focused. Uh, and this sense, the fact that you are selecting the very best, you uh, as a, as a, you know, innovative startup become a sort of uh, uh, innovation hub that attracts uh, and all these people, all these talents gravitate around uh, <laughs> this uh, pole of attraction. You know, I understand that. It's more uh, or less what you would see in the high-tech companies in Silicon Valley or something like that. Yeah, I think so. So th- that, yeah. that's, that's very that's very exciting, uh, for, even for the, for the candidates. And as I said, the last thing uh, that comes to my mind when I think of startup and a very dynamic and speedy startup, and also to the uh, investors of the startup, I know you attracted uh, investors, you have raised uh, important uh, uh, capital uh, in your rounds, uh, uh, record rounds, uh, uh, pre-seeds. Uh, you have uh, um, what's what's your radar when when you think about your you know your goals uh, your KPI uh, things like you know scalability revenues margin EBDA yeah 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 yeah, yeah. Uh, what's so, like, on your radar of productivity or you know customer satisfaction yeah refer- what, what's on yeah. your radar so like where I mean the good thing about the one of the cool thing about being uh, in a SaaS business in a B two B SaaS business software as a service is that in the end they're like all the SaaS B2B share some of the same revenue. So you don't need to invent. Uh, it's it's really easy to, to stick with a typical SaaS metrics. Uh, the only thing is that you there are a lot of SaaS metrics that you can follow. You need to follow the right one for your stage. So in our stage, what uh, is really our North Stars, are uh, of course the monthly recurrent revenue, so the MRR, the, the subscription on a monthly base, and the ARR, annual recurrent revenue, which is just the, the monthly recurrent revenue multiplied by 12, so that it gives you the forward revenue, uh, yearly for, for, uh, forward revenue scale of what you're doing. And uh, the other things that we are looking uh, is the um, customer success. So right now we are starting. I mean, now was uh, in the beginning was uh, qualitative. So we interviewed customers, we we talked to them a lot. We read the tickets to see if they were experiencing a good, uh, if they have a good experience. Mm-hmm. Now we are moving into measuring a lot uh, their experience, customer satisfaction. We will introduce NPS, Net Promoter Score, soon yeah. because in the end we need to to grow mm-hmm. and. Half of the engine of growth, probably. Maybe, I don't know if half or, but a significant part would be people saying that this tool is completely different from yeah. whatever they they have experienced, and this can enable our growth a lot. So we are focusing on 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 the customer experience, customer satisfaction, these kind of things. Uh, third place, uh, I would say uh, gross margin. Mm-hmm. We we start. We have a good idea of how it will look like, but we are start starting measuring gross margin. We are not super optimizing for gross margin right now. We are more optimizing still for growth, but compared to startups before the, the crisis, let's say or the collapse of the valuation, we already have measurement of the gross margin at months eight or nine, while probably two years ago, you 
start taking care about gross margin second or third year, like we 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 start looking at it. So I would say that those three are the the, the core points. Absolutely, yeah, and I think uh, in particular, as you said, the word of mouth and the referrals, you know, member gets member, that kind of stuff. That's also very important to get yeah. uh, the business uh, known on the market. Well, you know, Francesco, you really shared a lot of your uh, your experience, your thoughts, your your vision, and I think uh, that uh, um, you know it's been a s- extremely valuable uh, the insight you gave. You know, a lot, a lot of uh, uh, brilliant, brilliant ideas and uh, uh, experience and uh, vision. You know, what this uh, SaaS uh, software service business model uh, will go, and I think that's really. Uh, the future, in many ways, it's, uh, especially in countries where these models have been less, uh, um, you know, uh, widely spread. So I think this is a great innovation, uh, probably uh, right timing and a great timing for for a country like this. And uh, we hope that uh, uh, this uh, um, models will bring a lot more uh, productivity and uh, growth and innovation to your customers and to your uh, um, to the industry as well. So I would like to thank you very much for uh, the time that you said to dedicate. It's a really uh, great, um, fantastic uh, uh, contribution. And uh, I, I look forward to meeting you again and I wish you uh, all the best for this uh, uh, venture. Thank you. Right. Thank you so much for having me, Ivo. Always a pleasure. Absolutely. So talk to you soon and uh, um, all the best. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thanks a lot.